Father, we thank you for him and for Donna and bring them back to us safely, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. So uh, this week I wasn't sure where to go and something happened to me during the week. Well, I did something during the week and I had a severe case of foot and mouth disease. And uh, to, that, to my dear brother, I love him and I'm um, sorry for that. Um, but uh, I thought we'd go to James chapter 3. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to James chapter 3. So just... Uh, Wednesday nights we've been going through uh, James chapter 3 uh, and if you've been joining us Wednesday nights, I actually did James chapter 3 but it was only a couple of people here that evening so I've decided to do it this Sunday. Uh, but chapter 1 and 2 deal with being uh, doers um, of the word, not just hearers of the word. It also, well chapter 1 also deals with uh, partiality, um, deals with trials and things like that. But chapter 2 really digs into uh, living a life which lines up with what you believe. You know, a, a life where uh, fruit naturally comes forth from your faith in Jesus Christ. And, hey, it's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? It's a challenge for every single one of us daily. And uh, so we're dealing with, uh, we've dealt with works and now we're going to be dealing with words and that battle daily, obviously, uh, can be found in this thing called the tongue. It is a real battle. So we're going to deal with that today. We're going to look at that. Uh, the, the word's going to give us some pointers uh, on the tongue. Um, just a few things about James before we get right into that. One of the things I find interesting about James, good morning, uh, is uh, James was one of the earliest books written. And just to put that in perspective, John was written in, you know, something like 110 AD. And James was written, I've written it down here somewhere, uh, about 46 AD. So much, much earlier. It was written before a lot of the letters. And, you know, you can actually, it can really enlighten your understanding of the book of James when you understand that it was one of the very first books written. You know, so it's some interesting stuff. I encourage you to have a look at that, the chronological order of, how the books have been written and you'll find some very, very interesting stuff and the attitudes that you see within the books and how you understand the books, it will um, it, it'll enlighten you a little bit to that. So I think James, we, we can't mention James without mentioning the fact that he's Jesus' brother and he was known, known as James the Just. Um, but James, to his credit, he never really points that out to any degree. Um, James never says, uh, James, an apostle and the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. You never, you never see that in a book. He never lords it over other people because it would be a great temptation to use that as a mark of authority, wouldn't it? To say, I am the Lord's brother. You know, if you had an unruly congregation. I mean, this guy was heading up the, the ministry in Jerusalem. You'd have a temptation to say, I'm Jesus' brother. You better listen to what I say. You know, otherwise I'll get my brother onto you <laughs> I don't know but he instead he always refers to himself as a slave of Christ he, he, he refers to himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ and that humility and that that whole humility stems from the fact that he understood who Jesus Christ was you know he understood his lordship and even Mary you know if you read the song of Mary she talks about he's my saviour you know, they understood who Jesus was. And that's a big thing in the church today. We need to understand who the Lord is because it's very easy. I did a uh, message on First Kings at some point and I talked about Jeroboam setting up a golden calf. And he set up a golden calf. And he basically tried to make a God that was just a little bit like the one down at Jerusalem and then get the people to worship it. It wasn't really the same God. It was just a little bit different, but it had all the familiar... How do you say that? That one. And, you know, it had all those things. So it was very easy to suddenly be worshipping an idol. So we need to check ourselves. We need to check the scriptures and understand, uh, and understand who Jesus is and make sure we're not worshipping a false God. And you can imagine, you know, if somebody had the claim that James had today... Uh, they'd be writing books, 
you know, can you imagine if the Lord's brother was a lot with us today? Be writing books, he'd be making movies, he'd walk into a church, there'd be that whole uh, Christian celebrity thing, which, quite frankly, I don't really get into. I don't think it's. I don't. I think it lacks humility, and um, I think it actually leads people down roads they shouldn't be going down within the church. Corrupts the church, I believe. Even though I, I don't know if you guys have heard about the. There's a, an American TV show called Preachers or something like that, and it's apparently it's really bad. So, <laughs> there you are. Haven't seen it. Maybe I'm being too much of a harsh judge here, but uh, it's it's apparently not very good. Um, but I've always had a soft spot for James. Just again, still looking at James. Uh, you know, Jesus said a prophet is never accepted within his own country. A prophet is never accepted within his own household. And uh, Jesus pays uh, James a personal visit. If you go to if you're reading through it at some stage, 1 Corinthians 15.7, um, Jesus actually has to pay his brother a personal visit. He pays James a personal visit because James didn't believe he was the Messiah. James had rejected him as Messiah. And not many people know that. Um, or perhaps they do. Perhaps I don't know that they know that. But uh, he rejected Jesus as Messiah and I find that quite profound because I did that for a great deal of my life and I don't want to beat James up for that but uh, Jesus you know appears to James James beholds the beauty in a moment ago I just talked about how James understood his lordship or how's that for a lesson you know the resurrected Christ comes to your own brother uh you know, and for us who rejected Christ, we've tasted that fruit now, though, haven't we? You know, we've tasted that fruit, and the fruit is good, and that's what drives us to share our faith with people, because we see this world in pain, we see suffering. You know, people think that Christianity is bigoted. People think Christianity has no answers, but they have not tasted the fruit, and the fruit is very good. So it wasn't just Thomas eating humble pie, you know, doubting Thomas, you know the story. It wasn't just Thomas eating humble pie around that period, around 30 AD. It was uh, James also. So he beheld his, he beheld his brother full of glory. And uh, I think we really need to listen to this guy. You know, wonderful. Jesus' brother. I, I know he never pushed that thing, but I'm pushing it a little bit. So let's just get into, I'm going to do this in blocks, I'm going to do this quickly today, I'm not going to do my usual hour and a half sermon. So. My brothers, James chapter 1 verse 1, My brothers, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive a greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all, but if, um, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and also able to bridle the whole body. So that's a sermon right there. <laughs> So it, please, if I haven't covered something here today, that's because of lack of time. Uh, and there is a lot. There, there's probably a few sermons within that verse, or those three verses. But I was talking to Chris recently about Moses at uh, Massa Meribah. And uh, he was out there in the wilderness. Um, and he got angry at the people of Israel. And um, he... He got angry at the people because they were grumbling against him. The Lord, the Lord wanted to bless his people. You know, the Lord said, go up to the stone, speak to it and strike it with the staff and the water will come out and it will give sustenance to the, the livestock and the people. And so God was seeking uh, to, to instill a blessing on his people. And, you know, we're very fickle like the people of Israel. We, we make mistakes but the Lord has a wonderful heart towards us and, in, and instead because of his own you know uh, ill content he strikes the stone a few times and in doing that he's misrepresented God in that moment God wanted to uh, bless the people and Moses uh, basically made you know I, I mean if I was up there watching Moses I think Oof, God's angry today 
you know, he's up there bashing the hell out of that stone with his staff and uh, this doesn't, this doesn't look good. But uh, leading people in the kingdom of God is a very, very serious business. And, you know, for that infraction, for that one thing, God said to Moses, you will not enter the promised land. That's it for you. Jobs, that shop's closed. You will not cross over. So very, very serious business. And I think of Jesus, you know, a classic example is Jesus in the temple in Matthew 21, the cleansing of the temple. Uh, he was being misrepresented. Or Yahweh was being misrepresented. Not only were his children being exploited, that were the people being exploited by those at the temple, but they were using him as the platform to do it. And uh, they were doing it in, in his name. And I guess, you know, when we look around the church today, uh, you see many false preachers, you see people teaching funny doctrines. And I, for the life of myself, sit back sometimes and I listen to them because I like to know what's out there. So I'll sit down on YouTube and watch a sermon, sort of struggle through it. Uh, and I just think, my gosh, have you no fear, you know, to misrepresent God in that way, to stand before the people, to exploit people? You know, uh, I was talking to Chris about that, and he said, the, you know, surely the only way uh, someone can do that is if they have a seared conscience, you know, the conscience is seared. They no longer even, um, you know, know that it's sin. I mean, how could you knowingly do that and actually believe that God exists? You know, I don't, I, you know, I think pastors need to be paid. Um, I think they need houses to live in and I think they need food to eat, otherwise they're going to die. But I don't think they need private jets. They don't need private jets. And honestly... Uh, Shoot me, but Joyce Meyer, you know, building her little kingdom here on earth while uh, people are starving. Sorry, sorry, Joyce, not with you. I, I just, I, I couldn't, within myself, be given that much money. Uh, I, within myself, I couldn't be bestowed that much blessing and not just turn around and 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 give it out. And I believe. You know, we're called to do that. Are we to, to live like paupers? No, we're not. But there not there a balance? Isn't there a balance? And there is a greater condemnation on those that lead the people of God. You know? And I'll tell you one of the reasons. One of the reasons, and I love this uh, sequence of chapters, but King David, he runs off to the land of the Philistines at some stage because, you know, he's had enough of Saul, he's had enough of everything. He was depressed. Fair enough. We all get depressed, don't we? Even David. And he ran off to the um, land of the Philistines. He end, actually ended up where um, Goliath was born. So he actually went, you know, everything did a full circle. But here's the problem. All his men followed him. And his wives. And his children. You know, and their children. And that's the thing about leadership. Yes, leaders should be under greater condemnation. Absolutely. They should be under greater accountability. Absolutely. Why? Because people are following them. And a person like that, a person who is leading, has a has a pretensity to do, you know, very, very large amount of damage. Send a lot of people to hell, basically. I'm not sugarcoating that one. And we know Jesus, when the, uh, the temple was uh, cleansed, we know how he responded to this false representation. And this is Jesus we're talking about. He quietly sat down on the floor and he wove a whip. And then he got up and he whipped those guys out of the temple. Now, I don't know about you, but when I stand before the throne, that's not the guy I want to meet. So I want to be, you know, be faithful in how I share the word. I want to be as accurate as possible within the time constraints that we have today. But it's a beautiful scene, I think, and it shows Jesus' heart what is... God want these leaders to be, or what does God want these teachers or masters to be where he welcomes the people into the temple, he welcomes the widows in, he welcomes the sick and the children, and there he is, you know, ministering to them. And we see the Father's heart. We see the Father's heart revealed. And Jesus wants to know that teachers 
can care for his children, nurture and protect them, and above all, love and serve them. And I think in his absence, we can say we're very blessed to have a pastor like Chris. That guy does a lot of stuff we don't see, believe me. And the, clo- the more I get involved in the ministry, the more I see a guy that's just seven days a week, daily laying his life down, sacrificing his time, and it's endless. You know, that guy works tirelessly. And that's what a servant is. That's what a pastor is. That's what a leader is. Somebody who is going to lay themselves down. Somebody who is going to love God's people. And that's what that's about. I believe that's God's heart in those scriptures. That's why God is so serious about it because that's what he wants. He wants people that are shepherds. Oh, I better get moving. Um, sorry, lost my page. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths. This is from verse 3. That they, uh, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look at also ships, although they are large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest fire it kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set amongst our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of this life. Hold those words in your mind. And and and, though, and it is set on fire by the fires of hell. For every kind of beast and bird and of reptile, creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. Don't I know it? Don't I know that? And I was given a piece of advice, uh, and this is one of the greatest pieces of advice as you will ever get, or I got, and I'd like to pass on to you, and that is, and hold on to this, guys, whatever comes out of this thing can never be retrieved. You can't take it and put it back in. Always remember that. I, I, that always sticks in my mind. I don't know why it's never left me, but what... Whatever is said can never be retrieved. Whatever comes out can never be put back in. It's been said. Now the idea here in these verses is, uh, you know, an object of great power. You know, we're talking about horses and, you know, and sort of large sort of objects being directed by the tongue or a flimsy object or there's something steering them along. A horse directed by a bit or a ship by a rudder. And these things are responsible. What are they responsible for? They're responsible for direction. Okay? So in this case, it's referring to direction in life itself. So we're starting to understand how powerful this thing is all of a sudden. Direction in life itself. And I guess one of the tragedies of the tongue is this. We often say things, don't we? Have you ever done this? Because I know everyone's done this. You think you have... A love towards somebody in here, but what comes out of here does not represent that. You know, what's happening within here, for some reason, doesn't make it to here. We, uh, it's one of the tragedies. You know, we say things that we don't intend to say. Oh my gosh, how many times have I done that? I can't, I can't count. But uh, our prideful reactions seem, they just seem to bypass the thought center sometimes and they're just delivered straight to the tongue. That's what happens. You know, you get this pride that rises up and it's just bang, straight to the tongue. No brain involved. <laughs> just bypasses the brain somehow and it ends up on the tongue. But either way, the damage is inflicted regardless whether it's our intention or not. And uh, if you've ever operated a large vehicle, some of you may have operated harvesters, some of you, you know, tractors or mining equipment, things like that. You always give pause, don't you? Obviously, if you're steering a harvester or, you know, a uh, haul pack, you, you think about, hey, I'm not going to steer off, you know, off here because I'm going to end up in the bottom of the uh, super pit over there. Um, uh, you, you give a bit of thought about what you're doing. Uh, and any time we're going to speak forth words which affect another per- a person, 
for people we need to pause because the outcome of uh, poor direction, for example, a ship, you know, the analogy there of the ship, what happens if you steer a ship the wrong direction? You know, uh, it's pretty bad, isn't it? You know, you see a ship coming into the port and the, the guy doesn't slow down, he just speeds up and you can imagine... <laughs> You can imagine the catastrophic outcome. But words are powerful, you know. They are so powerful. God spoke existence into being. You know, Adolf Hitler, for every word he spoke publicly, I think the statistics is something like 10 or 12 people died for every single word that came out of his mouth. So if anyone tells you words are not powerful, they don't know what they're talking about because that's quite profound, isn't it? when you, you sit and look at words, and uh, sorry, bad example, um, but it's true. Words are powerful, you know, uh, in political circles and within the church, uh, within our homes. Words are powerful. And if words are, and I guess, I guess words, especially when uh, they're misused from a trusted position, uh, especially and as those verses in uh, 1, 2 and 3 pointed out from a master or a teacher or someone calling themselves a leader or even within the family home, it's very dangerous because words leave scars which sometimes are very hard to heal. And we've all got them, haven't we? You know, somewhere within ourselves there are words that have been said that have left scars within us. And it's very hard for those, you know, we hold on to those scars sometimes and Hopefully through the grace of Jesus Christ we can, you know, forgive. Well, I believe we can actually. Wrong statement. We can forgive through the grace of Jesus Christ. So the tongue can deal a lot of... So we've been focusing on outward damage and how the tongue can deal damage outwardly. But it also works in reverse. The tongue works in the opposite way. Has anyone ever heard of the Bismarck? Okay, for all you people that are a little bit more to the vintage side, probably know what the vin- Bismarck... I was trying to word that kindly, sorry. I was trying to word it kindly. Uh, you'll, know the, you'll know the Bismarck. Do you know the Bismarck, Steve? Okay. All right, I take all that back then. Okay. Okay, so the Bismarck was the pride of the German Navy during World War II. The Bismarck was, if the Bismarck was still around, it would still be a very, very formidable battleship. Three stories high, uh, cannons which shoot one ton projectiles and they outshoot any other ship by about 15 kilometres. So you can imagine, and the guns on the deck, this thing was just, it looked like of just a floating armada. It was really, it's really a scary thing to look at. And the hull was super thick. The plating on the deck was super thick. It was so thick, in fact, that when they were trying to destroy it, they were just shooting shells and shells and shells, and this thing just wouldn't sink. You know, it was really a, a marvel of modern engineering. It was a, it was a juggernaut. You know, you think of a juggernaut, an unstoppable mechanical uh, abomination. (laughs) That's what it was. And, I mean, this thing got sent out and it only had one uh, ship with it. And this thing could run into six or seven ships and sink all of them, no problem, because they were just out of range. They wouldn't be able to... Their guns weren't in in range of the Bismarck and the Bismarck was sending one-ton projectiles through through the deck. So they didn't last very long. And uh, it's interesting, the Bismarck was destroyed by a little rickety plane called a swordfish. And a swordfish were the planes that were used in World War I. And just to put it in perspective, I actually heard the testimony of the guy who was flying the swordfish, this little double-winged rickety plane with a... With a uh, with a torpedo strapped on the bottom and they had to hang out of the side of the plane and look at the waves and wait for a wave to go down and then drop it so it landed between the waves and it wouldn't go everywhere. And uh, they were so slow, the reason they were successful is because the Bismarck thought they had, you know, at least World War II weaponry 
So it's machine guns were shooting in front of the, these planes because they'd set the machine guns to shoot at a certain rate. So they were shooting in front of the planes because the old swordfish was so slow. <coughs> so they weren't shooting them out of the sky. And this guy comes along and these things were terribly inaccurate. They were really shocking. <laughs> and, you know, all these swordfish come in and they all drop the torpedoes and the torpedoes just went, shoom. <laughs> they just went everywhere like spaghetti, basically. That's what these things did. And this old man, he's, you know, he's sitting there with his walking stick and he's giving his testimony and I flew in and he said, and he said the most exciting thing was all the uh, tracer bullets which were lighting up like fireworks. And he said, oh, they were shooting past my plane. It was awesome. And he dropped his torpedo and the torpedo went in and it, where did it hit? You know, it hit the rudder. <laughs> it went like this all over the place and it hit the rudder of the Bismarck. And believe me, if that didn't happen, it could be, there could have been serious, serious repercussions because they would have controlled the sea. Um, so basically, cut a long story short, uh, the most vulnerable part is the thing that can bring us down. We can do that, we can inflict damage, but, uh, you know, if you, you think of people that, uh, who've blown testimonies, Man, you can do it in two minutes flat with this thing. You know, give me two minutes and if I tried my hardest, I'd never be let through the front door again. Couldn't I? You know, because we know what's in here, but I could use this thing and decimate myself and we've got to be careful we don't do that. Entire families split up, you see relationships being destroyed, you see churches being divided. So you see the tongue is not just responsible for the direction of life. So listen to this. The tongue is not just responsible for the direction of life but leads to the destination. So the tongue will lead us to the destination of life. We need to be very careful about this thing. I'm just going to quickly read Psalm 34. You can turn there if you like. Starting at verse 11. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord, who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such that have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked. Remember that one, evil shall slay the wicked. And those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. So it talks a little bit there about, you know, evil that caves in on itself. And I just want to elaborate a little bit on that. Sometimes things, you know, sometimes things are, are better off uh, left unsaid because, the, the, you know, the psalm there is also talking about, you know, there's a lot we have to leave in God's hands and we, we, we have to battle against the flesh to do that. I mean, I battle against the flesh to say, you know what, I have to leave this in the Lord's hands. I don't need to retaliate here. And I think one of the things... Uh, people need to understand is that people are not stupid. You know, when we're talking about people, uh, you know, when we're talking about others, you can tell a tale if you like, but people are not silly and we tend to start thinking, you know, if, when this evil heart takes over and we start telling a tale, you know, we need to remember that people are not as silly as we think they are sometimes. I had a person ring me not too long ago and I'll 
just want to make very clear this person was not from this church. But she proceeded to tell me, she rang me up and said, uh, somebody is spreading lies about you, Sean, all over town. They're rubbing your name into the dirt. And I mean, this was really, really malicious stuff she was saying on the phone. I'm like, whoa, really? She's doing this and she's doing that and she's doing this. And then she gave me, you know, and said, this is who it is. And what are you going to do about it now? And I sort of, this is ruining my day. <laughs> you know, sort of got up and I was having a good time, relaxing there, playing computer games or whatever. You get this phone call. I'm thinking, man, this is not good. And uh, she said, so what are you going to do? Tell me. I want to know. And I said, well, nothing. She said, what do you mean you're going to do nothing? And I said, well, I said, it's fine. She goes, what, do you, what does that mean? It's fine. I just said, it's fine. I'm not doing anything. Okay? I've got to go. I've got to get back to Battlefield 3. <laughs> so I hung up the phone got on with my game, and then I'm sort of sitting there thinking about this, thinking, oh, gosh, what do you do? So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll do what the Lord says. I rang the person up who apparently was destroying my reputation, and I said, I just want you to know that I really appreciate you as a person and that I love you and I care for you, and, um, and that's it. And I didn't mention what had taken place. But later on, she rang me back and she said, you'll never guess what happened. And I said, tell me, what's happened? And she said, somebody is a woman, um, apparently I've done something to it, she's been ringing everybody and she's been trying to assassinate my character. And, she, and this is really, really malicious stuff. I thought this would get everyone interested. Everyone loves a bit of gossip. But, uh, but, and you know, and I'm sitting back going, really, you know, and I, and later on, I thought to myself, man, I could have, been, I could have been a real twit, you know, I could have been just led along like a puppet if I had bought into it. We need to be really, really mindful. Remember, we're steering a big ship, and that ship can do a lot of damage. So again, we have to uh, we have to give pause before we before we open this thing, and I don't think there's anything more ugly and um, you know disheartening than seeing brothers and sisters within the church tearing each other to pieces through words. There's nothing uglier. Um, I think there was a time when we. Uh, when we didn't really know what was coming out of our mouths was sin. I think before we were saved, everything was just impulsive pride, wasn't it? And, you know, do you remember that time? For those who weren't born up in Christian families and homes, uh, everything that came out of my mouth before I was a Christian was just impulsive pride. It just, it just sort of poured forth from me. But now I have God directing my spirit. I have God... God's spirit living within me. And he, you know, and unfortunately, still, sometimes things can, like I said just this week, I had a serious case of foot and mouth disease. And man, did I, you know, Holy Spirit paid me a visit. He did. And he had some words with me. And, um, and then he forgave me for I beat myself to death. Um, but, you know, uh, if you think about those times, we never had the wisdom or understanding to know why we had no peace. And um, have you ever heard? Of, uh, have you ever heard this statement? Trouble follows me everywhere I go. Have you ever heard that one? Man, that's a cop out. That is really. That's really. Everywhere I go, trouble's just waiting around the corner to jump out at me. See, it's not my fault. You know, everywhere I go, there's trouble. I'm always arguing with people. There's always conflict. You know, and I, and I have known people in my past and I still meet people today. And, you know, James talks about the course of this life being set on fire by the fires of hell. And that's basically 
what's happening there, you know, and people who live like that, everything's a drama. And if there's ups and downs, they're always on a down, and you see the damage and carnage left behind by a little thing called the tongue. Proverbs 20, uh, verse 3 says, It's to a man's honour to avoid strife, but a fool is quick to quarrel. And 15.18 in Proverbs says, A hot-tempered man stirs up dissensions, but a patient man calms quarrels. So I guess we've looked at a lot of negative stuff this morning. So let's look at some positives, because there's always a bright side, isn't there? Okay, Let's get out of this uh, horribly negative stuff here. And um, But it's, it's stuff we need to hear, do you think? Isn't it stuff we need to hear? Because it's something I'm probably going to transgress within about the next 30 minutes after getting down. <laughs> so I've just got to... We need to know this. It can never be controlled, you know that? It's never going to be fully tamed as long as, as long as you're here on earth. So don't, you know, condemn yourselves. But we can, we can look at this with some wisdom and we can look at this and we can gauge what we're going to say. We can think about statements like, once it comes out, it can never go back in. And man, I really hate, I hate that. You know, I, I do that all the time. I say something and go, man, that was so stupid. And I go home and I sit and think, how could you say something like that? You're an idiot. Anyway, I better move on. Positive. We're looking at positive stuff. Okay. Now, with it, with the tongue, we can bless our God, the Father, and with it we can curse men who have been made in the, in the image of God, or similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. So there's a positive side. My brethren, now listen, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water? And bitter from the same opening. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and fresh water. So one thing we've covered is destructive words come very easily to the lips. They just shoot straight to the lips. But words uh, can also bring incredible restoration. So let's not discount this. You know, if we're willing to see through this thing, our own pride and our own flesh, and I guess that's why words of destruction come to the tongue easier, because words of restoration, especially if it's within a conflict, especially if it's you know within a household, words of restoration require us to do two things. Words of destruction, boom, straight to the tongue. And out they go. No no brain involved, you know. Words of restoration actually require a few different things. Words of restoration require us to push down the flesh. So that's one thing. We need to think about it and we need to deliver it. So words of restoration actually are much harder. And I think, you know, if we're all honest, the hardest thing is the pride, isn't it? It's the old pride that fires up. She told me that. Oh no, I'm not. You know, I'm not. I'm not doing this. I'm the man of the house, or so, you know, something like that. And I, and I, you have to rein yourself in. You have to push down your pride and think. Well, hang on, I'm actually being really unreasonable here, and I'm just saying this stuff. And you know what? It's senseless. It's destructive, and it doesn't belong within a Christian home. And I need to. I need to submit to the Lord, you know, if I want my wife to submit to me. So uh, one of the most memorable moments, uh, I'll just quickly talk about this, and that was with, with a few words I was able to undo 15 years of damage. So I, I, me and my father, my stepfather, both uh, hurt each other when we were younger. And he was a young man taking on a family and I was a young man who was just a stupid young man, basically. And uh, I said things to him and I had attitudes and ideas and they didn't line up. We had a massive falling out and I left home for 15 years, basically. 
left home for 15 years. Uh, and I got saved, you know. Um, and I went back to him and I said, I got saved, spirit of God coursing through my body and in my mind. And there were some pretty major wrongs done there. You know, some people would say, I won't forgive that. But I was so overwhelmed by my own need of forgiveness. I was so overwhelmed that a sinner like me could be forgiven my sin. I thought, who am I to stand in the way of forgiveness that God has commanded me? You commanded of me. Who am I? You know, so I went and saw him and I tell you what, it took about three minutes. Three minutes. I said to him, I love you. I said, can we be father and son? And um, I tell you what, three minutes, three minutes, words of blessing, words of restoration, the pure water of Jesus Christ flowing from me. It was all done and dusted, you know. And it, So words are powerful, yes. Words are destructive, yes. But three minutes of words, you know, those words of restoration within three minutes undid 15 years of words of destruction. And God is always greater, isn't he? And good will always conquer over evil. You know, we can trust in that. And we can trust in those words of restoration. And the analogy there uh, that he was uh, using was the uh, analogy of a natural source or a spring. And if you drive up towards Geraldton, you'll cross uh, paths with these salt lakes and you'll see these salt lakes and you'll see basically these skeleton-like trees coming up. Have you all seen salt lakes? We've got a few around here, not like the ones up in the wheat belt. They're massive for the, uh, the land has been damaged up there somewhat because of old farming methods. But you see, you know, you, you basically see this source of salt and you basically see everything being, of the life being sucked out of uh, the vegetation and everything around it. And it's like that within our relationships, within our churches and life in general. Um, and Jesus, you know, and James has been talking a lot about a uh, life which matches up with faith uh, and he talks and you know he says stuff like uh, J uh, Jesus in Matthew 7 says you'll know them by their fruit um, so you know he says uh, he, he, he basically says James asks a question he says what kind of spring are you what kind of spring are you are you a salt spring or are you, are you a fresh water spring? Are you, are you pouring forth blessing? Are you pouring forth restoration? Are you pouring forth healing? Or are you pouring forth foul water, which is basically killing all around it? And you will see and meet people, uh, you will, you'll see people who can never hold down a friendship. You can see relate, everywhere they go, relationships are being broken. And you see, why? Why can't this person hold down a relationship? And that's because we're springs of water, you know. And what comes forth from you will affect everything around you. There will be restoration or there will be destruction. It will be healthy around you or people will be sick within your own home, within your workplace, within your church. People will be sick or people will be healthy. And we, can, we can't pass the buck on this, guys. This is directly related to us and it's directly related to what's coming out of our mouths. And that's the one thing about James is James is a book of self-examination and that's why a lot of people just like to skip past it because it is... You know, John Corson says, put on your crash helmet, we're going into James. You know, when, when, when he does the book of James. So we need to make sure, guys, and I'm going to finish here. I've got, uh, I've got some other stuff here. If anyone's interested, they can come and see me later. 
but I think we've um, we've still got communion to come yet. So, but guys, think about that analogy. Think about the state of your households. Think about the state of your workplaces and your relationships, and ask yourself the question: Am I pouring forth that which is good? Am I feeding and nurturing, you know, that which is around me? Is it is it healthy? Or is it dying, or is it is it sick and withering? So James, like I said, is a is a book which deals with a uh, a life which lines up with what you believe. And guys, my encouragement to you, my you know, and I have to do this regularly. You know, I have to come before the Lord, and that is, I have to analyze my surroundings. I have to see the fruit that is coming forth from my life. You know, Jesus said, you know, you won't find thorns on a fruit tree, you won't find fruit on a thorn bush. It's not complicated stuff. You know, a, a, fresh, a spring will pour forth salt water or a spring will pour forth fresh water. So have a look at your lives. Have a look around you. Have a look at what's going on around you. And if, if things aren't great, it doesn't mean, oh no, well, I'm going to start beating myself up with a baseball bat. It just means that we need to focus on words of restoration, words of peace. I'll tell you, here's a great rule I have in my house. No one is ever to use the words, you always. That's a rule in my house. That, those words are never allowed to be put into a sentence when referring to another person within the household, ever. Because isn't that a condemning statement? You always do this. You are never going to change. You know what? That's a foul spring. And you may, we may feel justified in saying stuff like that sometimes, but guess what? Nearly missed it. This one, this book... This gospel says that you're not justified. You're not justified at all. You can't go around using condemning language. Instead, use words of restoration. I'll, I will do this. I'm just going to finish with this. And I just want to read the last two verses of the book of James. Um, if I can find that. Last two verses of the book of James, read them with me, verse 17 and 18, and then we'll pray. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So guys, let the fresh water flow and let the fruit of God manifest in your life and think about just think about those couple of statements I made you can't put once words are out they can't be put back in and really think about condemning and maybe go home maybe talk to your partner whatever talk about condemning statements that are made within the home and discuss them because you always is you always it means always it means it's never going to change and that is not helping anyone so, you know, as Christians, let's beat down the pride. Let's examine the tongue and examine what's being said within the family homes and bring restoration and peace. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. And Lord, we're truly humbled by it. And Father, we are all transgressors, Father, every single one of us. Holy Father, we can only come before your throne we can only ask for your forgiveness, Father God, for those transgressions. Father, we can only ask, Lord, that by your supernatural power, by your Holy Spirit, that you would change us. Father, that your spirit would be greater than the pride that resonates within us. Father, help us to push that down, to come before our loved ones with peace, with restoration, with love, with joy. Father, and apply that to how we use our tongues within our households. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.